everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Are You Kidding Me? I'm Naomi Schaefer Riley, and I'm a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And I am Ian Rowe, also a resident fellow at AEI. And today we are going to talk about some of the options for schooling this fall because everything is up in the air. And to guide us through this whole thing, we have Bethany Mandel, who is coming to us to talk about everything from homeschooling to pods. We won't talk about her Twitter threads on killing grandma and all that today, (laughs) but we do want to find out what parents are supposed to do because there are approximately, at least for us in New York anyway, six weeks left till school starts, even fewer weeks for those people elsewhere in the country. And parents are tearing their hair out wondering what is going to happen. So thank you, Bethany, for joining us. Bethany is a contributor at Ricochet. She is a, let's see, where else is she? I don't even know. (laughs) The Washington Examiner blog, the forward. The forward, yeah, you name it. So let's start with this question. Bethany, I was curious. You actually asked this in a Twitter thread recently. You said, why am I, as a homeschooling mother, so interested in making sure that regular schools open up this fall? So I want to know the answer to that question. Why are you really pushing for schools to open? Aren't you worried about all the poor effects this could have on our kids? So I have two concerns. So number one, Because I homeschool, I appreciate that it's difficult and it's not a lifestyle that everyone would choose. And I completely understand that. And it is a lifestyle that I happen to really love, but it's not for everyone. And it's really concerning, especially as a woman, to see so many women being forced into this homeschooling role against their will. It's forcing people out of the workforce. I mean, people, it's forcing women out of the workforce. I went to the doctor today and I was chatting with the receptionist and she said, my last day is in three weeks. And I said, oh, what's going on? She told me, well, my kids aren't going back to school. This was sustainable when it was a couple of weeks. She's quitting her job? Yeah, because she can't can't keep on playing this game with her husband and they're both of their jobs. And she said, like, we're now staring down the barrel of indefinite. There's at least four more months of this. I wouldn't be surprised if they don't come back at all. My husband and I were able to trade off childcare and my kids played in the parking lot of the doctor's office this summer, but I can't keep on doing this. I can't keep on doing this to my kids, my husband, myself. I'm at a loss. And so I'm just calling an audible and I'm saying, you know what? I'm done. And my focus will be my children because it's not fair to anyone in my household. So that's one reason. The other reason is I was raised by a single mother and I think about what life would have looked like if I were a child and this were going on. My mom was a social worker and made probably the equivalent of $35,000. She had no money for childcare ever. And I was left alone at six years old. And what would have happened were this my childhood now, I would have been left alone all day long at six or seven years old because what's the alternative? Well, this is something Ian and I have talked about on previous podcasts is you have, we think, you know, a huge rise that's happening in child neglect issue. Mm -hmm. It's true for younger kids who are going to get left alone. And it's true for older kids who, you know, cannot be monitored by their parents. And so, yeah, I think that that is definitely what's going to happen for the vast majority of public schools that don't look like they're opening, right, Ian? Well, unfortunately, the vast majority of public schools are still not ready. And frankly, it's not clear when they will be ready. That's why I think so many parents are hearing, you know, in defense of districts, you know, they're hearing half-baked plans and are feeling the necessity to figure out a plan to homeschool. I mean, what do you say to those parents, Bethany? Because they, I don't think actually they want the obligation to do what you're saying, but there are many feel yeah. there isn't an option. Yeah, I mean, if people wanted to homeschool, they would have already been homeschooling. Everyone who's being forced into it this year is trying to basically figure out what to do with almost no notice. The thinking in my mind that went into homeschooling was years in the making. And I was reading sort of educational theory and best practices. And now I'm seeing friends that are parents. And I'm like, you have to decide what this is going to look like in a matter of weeks. And you have to juggle your household obligations. Honestly, I, we feel blessed that I already homeschooled because I honestly don't know how people are doing this. It's, well, it's so stressful. Yeah, I think what parents are looking for is somewhere in between yeah. homeschooling and in-person schooling. And what I call that is public school at home where teachers are actually still teaching 
in a synchronous, you know, online synchronous right. manner so that the full burden isn't on parents to take on the role that you're talking about. So I wrote a piece in The Atlantic a couple of months ago, and I actually, I disagree with you. I think that it's easier to homeschool because when kids are doing this distance learning, they're following someone else's curriculum and someone else's schedule. And so they're saying, okay, sit your kids down and this is what we're doing. But there's a lot of kids for whom distance learning is not working or they think in different ways. And, and already in the classroom, it's difficult to cater to those needs. I was a classroom teacher 10 years ago, just for a year. So like, I'm, I'm not talking from a wealth of knowledge here. But when you're dealing with a screen, it's hard to tell if kids are getting it and you can't provide individual help. You can't sort of give 15 kids busy work and then walk over to that one kid in the same way. You'd have to like shut and mute people. It's, it's a structure for sure. Yeah, it's really hard. And so I think it's much easier to set your own schedule and set your own priorities based on your pre-existing knowledge of your child. The benefit for last year's distance learning was that teachers already had relationships and they already knew right. kids. And they're not going to have that this fall. They're not going to have it. For parents, I think there's a sort of a, a game going on here where, you know, even for the parents who have schools or school districts that have a plan for partial opening, I have a friend who recently talked to a principal who's a head of a private school here in Westchester, and he said, look, basically, best case scenario, we're in school for eight weeks before we have to shut it all down again. Right. And so one concern here is, even if you get the schools to open, where is the consistency that you need in order to be teaching those kids? And, you know, maybe it's better to just start with the pod or the homeschooling, you know, first thing, and then you can have some plan through the whole school year, as opposed to wondering every week, is this the week it's Yeah, and I down? honestly, I doubt how much actual education is going to happen on distance learning this year. I think that very little of it happened last year, and there's going to be even less of this year because a lot of parents aren't signing on. I, I read the shocking statistic in Chicago that 55% of teachers I didn't sign it's on. Unbelievable. And what are we paying these people for? Hello, are you kidding me? I saw that same statistic and fell off my chair. And by the way, in that particular story, it was a throwaway line. Yes, at the, at the end of the story, end. that was the headline. That should be the headline. Exactly. I thought, did you see the statistic about Stuyvesant, which is yeah. one of the you know best test high schools in New York? I think they said 70% of teachers said they were not coming back. Why? They wouldn't come back in person. Oh, that must be nice. Can you imagine if, if grocery store employees or pharmacists or literally any other profession were like, yeah, I'm just not, I'm just not comfortable. Sorry. <laughs> like meat packers, doctors, dentists, like you name it. If electricians and plumbers and grocery store workers are working, what makes teachers so special? Well, this is one ad one advantage maybe you have in your schools, Ian. I was talking to somebody whose kids go to success academies recently, in addition to obviously not having the union issues, they also have a much younger teacher core. So these are people who are all in their 20s and 30s who are perfectly happy to go back and not, you know, worried about their health. I mean, you know, obviously with the, with the older teachers, you do understand, you know, some of the concerns, mm -hmm. but some of the charter schools in New York have like, you know, a teacher core, you know, that's all under the age of 35. So it is true. We generally have a younger teacher force, but that said, there are increasing stories of younger adults actually contracting the coronavirus. And so it is to be seen because all charter schools right now are canvassing their teacher population to say, will you be willing to come back? And we have some big, even HR issues in terms of can we force, once you get to a certain level, you can't actually run school, certainly in-person school. So Bethany, what do you say then to folks who are saying it's, it's not safe to come back? What do you say to them? I mean, I think you would say the same thing that my dentist is telling her hygienists. Okay, this is where we part ways. If you're not 65 years old or have a pre-existing condition, the world is going to have to keep on turning. It's a really scary thing, but my dentist is having the same conversations with her hygienist. And she said, like, I can't keep on paying you. I'm sorry. Right. So in terms of what is, you know, what's possible here, one thing that has been shocking to me, I mean, I know this is true and there's been a lot of publicity in Fairfax County, but here in Westchester, our school district sent out a survey this week about what parents want. So we are in this countdown to school going back, and they're so far behind in terms of preparation. 
I wonder if we can just talk about what, what was the holdup? Like, why couldn't we have been preparing for this for the last five months? They don't care. They don't care what you want. They're just trying to be nice. They're just like, sure. What it's like when I ask my kids what they want for dinner and I know I'm making pizza, (laughs) but I'm like, your choices are pizza or I don't know, something like tofu scramble. And they're like, Oh, I'll go for the pizza. I'm like, great. Cause there's actually no tofu. Well, they don't care or they just presume parents won't rise up in opposition to them. They'll be able well, to do what I mean, they want. What can people do? Well, there it is. That, there it is. You There's just said- nothing to be done. You're, we are all at their mercy and they know it. So who's going to win this year and who's going to lose? So, I mean, the chasm between the haves and the have-nots is going to become the Grand Canyon. The kids who have parents who are able emotionally, academically, financially to homeschool their kids are actually going to, I think, turn out really well. They're going to have a lot of individualized attention. I love homeschooling for a reason. I think it's, it produces great educational outcomes with motivated participants. But the kids who don't have parents who are willing and able for any number of very valid reasons, and sometimes not valid reasons, because there are just also just not great parents out there sometimes. But the kids who don't have parents who are able to help them on this journey are going to fall so far behind it will be insurmountable. Yeah. Wow, that's a very hopeful message. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I hope we liked a meritocracy for whatever we had because are it's the, now gone. Are the parents who are organizing their own pandemic pods, are they morally repugnant or are they just doing the best thing for their kids? They're doing the best thing for their kids. I mean, that's what we all do. So there's this interesting question when I taught in Cambodia last year, or not last year, 10 years ago for a year. And we were hated by the other NGOs in town because we fed our kids three meals a day. We had them come super early and we gave them breakfast. We gave them lunch and then we fed them dinner on the way home. And by third grade, if you walked into a village, you could tell our kids from the other kids because they were several inches taller. And by the time they graduated high school, it was sometimes close to a foot. And people would criticize us in the NGO community. You know, you are unfairly giving these kids an advantage, a physical advantage, an academic advantage. And I'm like, I'm sorry, are we supposed to be sorry for feeding children because we can't feed all the children? I'm not sorry. Well, actually, in the current narrative, yes. Yes, but that's the crazy thing. I will never apologize for doing what's best for my own children, and no other parent should do the same. We're all stuck in a really crappy situation, myself included. I homeschool, but all of the extracurricular activities that I brought my kids to are now gone. I don't want to teach art. I don't want to teach ceramics, but now I'm like, I don't know what to do here. That is an, an interesting thing that is, it's not going to look exactly like homeschooling looked before. No. And I also think that you're going to see that chasm in the extracurricular activities too. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, already this summer, yeah. it's been very clear, you know, that there are some people who are, you know, paying private coaches for their kids to do different sports mm-hmm. and who are able to afford, you know, some super expensive, very small enrollment camps, that sort of thing. And, and I think that's probably going to continue well into the fall as yeah. parents are going to you know, who are competitive about their kids' schoolwork or, you know, are also super competitive about their kids' athletic performance. And yeah. That's there and, too. and I'm worried about sort of the, this may be like a weird thing to be worried about in the scope of things, but what is our Olympic performance going to look like in 10 years? <laughs> we have no gymnasts and like our arts are going to be completely to the curb, like no singers, no artists, because all of the kids that are our kids' ages are not going to have the same advantages. I don't know. Just a weird, weird thought that pops into my head sometimes. Yeah. I think about babies being born. Are, you know, nine months from now, are babies going to be born or more, are more babies going to be born? I so know. I have been researching this a weird <laughs> amount and I, can, I have the answer for you. Yes, and it is? And it is people are having fewer babies because they are scared of the economics. And I mean, do you want to be pregnant in the middle of a pandemic? It's pretty scary. But it's interesting. I saw so I had a home birth this last time and I was chatting with my home birth midwife and she said, like, we are in demand like we've never been in demand before. They had like started a splinter practice and they were worried about having enough business to support both practices. And now they're like, we are drowning. Oh. Yeah, no one wants but, to go to a hospital. Either. Yeah. But I mean, once this pandemic season passes of people who are already pregnant, I wonder how much business they're going to have. Yeah, that's going to be tough. 
All right. Well, parents have plenty to think about for this fall. And maybe, Bethany, you'll come back on and talk to us about what actually happens in September because heaven only knows. Yeah, really. Um, (laughs) So thanks, everyone, for listening to the latest episode of Are You Kidding Me? You can find our episodes on the AEI podcast channel or wherever you get your podcasts. I am Naomi Schaefer Riley. And I am Ian Rowe. Thanks for listening. And thanks, Bethany, for joining us today. Thank Thank you. Thank you.